read Mr. Martin Parr during confinement with all our students from Ecole Courtrajme. And uh, in the school, you have to know that we have a cinema section that is uh, here today that was created by Laj Lee, a childhood friend of mine, but also the director of the movie Les Miserables. And we have an art section that is here today with um, all the teachers and all the students. So first question is from Ismael. And again, a big, big thank you, Martin, for doing this during this crazy time. Nice to meet you. Um, you sometimes seem to be at a distance from the people you are photographing. Uh, how do you position yourself toward them? Do you feel in touch with your time or disconnected from it? Thank you. Um, it depends what sort of shoot it is. Sometimes when you're doing a crowd with lots of people, uh, you know, it's quite easy to sort of camouflage what you're doing. Uh, sometimes, um, like this morning, I've been fairly off in queues outside supermarkets. Uh, people are watching you because they've got nothing else to watch. Uh, and it's more tricky. And uh, then you can use body language to sort of try and disguise what you're doing. And then there are other occasions where, you know, you're actually meeting the people. You've got consent and it's a party or an opening or something like that. And, you know, you're, you're going around, people being very friendly. So each situation has a different approach in terms of how you photograph it. But there are very good ways of... Um, of disguising what you're doing. And the other thing I would suggest is that after you've taken a picture, you don't look at the person and look guilty. You know, I try not to look at people after I photograph them, if I'm trying to just uh, catch them unaware. Okay, next one is from Lila. Uh, my question is, over the years, have you noticed uh, an evolution in the way uh, people react to the photographic act? Um, I'd say how people react to the photography art. I mean, I'd say in France, it's much more consistent. We don't have the same problem we did have in the UK. For example, the Tate, who is the high cathedral of art in the UK, it's only in 2003 that they finally accepted that photography could be an art in its own right. Up to that point in time, the only way you could be collected by the Tate is if you're an artist that used photography. So since then, they've been a lot more generous and a lot more um, appreciative of photography. They have curators of photography. So that really was the turning point. Uh, in France, you know, you have a great tradition exemplified by things like the Arl Festival, Paris Photo, the Pompidou, where the love of photography is, is, is a lot more clear. So I would say France is well ahead of us than, than in the UK, but we are catching up slowly but surely. Good. Wow, happy to hear we're ahead of something here. <laughs> uh, next question is Florence. Hi. So my question is um, some image seems to have been taken on the uh, taken on the fly. How do you actually approach your subject, and how do they react? Well, I'd say it's easier in the UK to photograph in the street than it is in France. France is a big problem because A, it's technically against the law not to photograph anyone, but to actually use it even in an art and publishing context. And uh, the French are more paranoid about being photographed, even though France as a society loves photography. But this is very similar to the first question where I often uh, will not point my body towards the thing that I'm actually photographing. I, I would try and disguise that. And then I would swing round, take the picture. After the picture's taken, I would be swung round again. So if the person looks up, if I'm using flash, they wouldn't have seen that I've taken photographs. So you can hide behind the sort of, the dance of a photographer. Uh, and then there are some occasions where you actually are doing a proper portrait in the way that GR often, JR often does. And you know, there you're meeting people, talking to people, and having a sort of proper collaboration and, uh, and, and yeah, joining together of, uh, of the same goal. Very true, very true. Well, I didn't realize we were so paranoid about it uh, uh, here, but it's true. I mean, you know, people are, uh, you know, have an eye for that here. They don't like to have their picture taken without- No, and I'll tell you where it's even worse, French colonies in Africa. Oh Boy, yeah, wow, Africa. okay. Like Senegal, wow, it's almost impossible. Unless you wow. throw money at them. Wow, I've never been. Okay. Right. Uh, English colonies in, fr in, in Africa are easier. But the French okay. colonies, if I, had to, if I had to not go to a place to take a photograph, it would be a French colony in Africa. Okay. Damn, I've never it's been. It's a challenge for you, JR. 
<laughs> yeah, the French, we did bad. We did a lot of bad in the past. And so at least we have to pay a price for it. Yeah, but you have great photographers and you love photography. So I forgive you every time. <laughs> we try, we try. Okay, Emily, next question. It's yours. Hi, uh, Martin. Um, my Hi. question is, according to what you just said previously, um, have you ever had any legal problems of taking... Oh, uh, yeah, good. I mean, every five years, someone may object to being photographed and it's never gone to a court. And luckily in France, because I've done a book on Paris and I've photographed in France many times and I basically try and generally ignore the sort of law about what you can and cannot do. Uh, so most of the time, people, when they see the photographs that I've taken, <coughs> they write to me and we always send a print or a file. So it generally, the response is very positive. I think in my whole life, I've had maybe two occasions where someone threatened a legal case and they never came to anything. So I, neither have I been beaten up, before you ask. So neither have I had a court case. So luckily, I've got away with those two things. But you've got to remember, most of the time, the force of photography is a very positive one. You know, it, it, you're asking questions as if going out and photographing in the world is, is an issue, it's a problem. But for example, when I did an eye project on the goat door in Paris, I had someone with me all the time, you know, because that's a tricky place to photograph. So in no way could you take a picture there without the consent literally signed on a sheet of paper. So that's probably the most difficult area that I've ever photographed in. Oh, in the world? Wow. Yeah, uh, apart from Senegal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Aristide, next question. I know you've been very inspired by the work of uh, John Hine, the postcard photographer. Correct. I wanted to know uh, why did it inspire you, how, and uh, I know you collect postcards, and I wanted to, to ask you about this. Okay, well, yes, you're absolutely right. I, I love the work of John Hine. We have in the UK, we have these weird things called holiday camps, which are called Butlins. And I went to work there in the 70s, and that's when I discovered the John Hine pictures. And these are very brightly colored images that show scenes with the amazing decoration in these camps. And uh, they're all staged, so if, if you like, they're like Gregory um, Crudson, before Gregory Crudson was really on the scene. And they're amazing pictures, and they were done for postcards, but they were done with five by four, you know, big transparencies. So the quality is absolutely staggering. So I like these, started to collect them. I have indeed uh, done a book with the John Hind uh, uh, postcards. And I've also collected, I did a project called Boring Postcards, which did very well. So I'm a big fan of postcards. Postcards now sadly have gone because no one sends them anymore. But um, I look back with great affection to my postcard collecting and my postcards that I used to send and receive myself and collect. And uh, why, why this spe very special object? Um, because I just like the idea of someone selecting a picture, making sure it's the right picture for the right person, writing a message on it, putting it in the post, and then physically receiving it a few days later. It's a bit like us sending a, a text photo now, except we do it so easily. With the postcard, you actually have to make a bit of an effort. You have to go and buy them, you have to buy the stamps, you have to write the cards, and then send them off. So, you know, in a sense now, it's too easy to send a text with a bit of caption underneath. It's, it's just too easy. And people are lazy, remember, you know? <laughs> and we you. do keep the postcards. We don't necessarily keep the text, so that's another good... Uh, yeah, reason. and of course, the thing, the danger with um, things on a phone is we're, they're only two buttons away from it being deleted forever. You know, so uh, I, I always urge people to print out the pictures they've got on their phone because, um, you know, you could, someone could steal the phone and you'd never see them again. So I'm a great believer in printing out. So even though now in my work, I shoot digitally, we print everything out to a 2030 print um, and uh, you know, of the pictures that I've edited and I will edit then from the prints. It's much easier to edit from a print than from a file on a screen. And it also means I built up a collection of, um, of 20 by 30 prints throughout my whole career. So I have three quarters of a million, 20, 30 by prints. And they're, if you like, my sort of solid archive of, of who I am and what I've been and where I've gone. You must print out things, right, JR? Yeah, definitely. Whatever I can keep print out, I, I do keep. I mean, it's, uh, even if we're from different generation, I have that nostalgia in me of things that I maybe didn't knew or I was right at the beginning of the text. Yeah. So I love yeah. postcards. 
I love, and when I spent some time with Agnes Vara, she reminded me how important those were. And she kept sending me postcards everywhere. So I, I realized that's what I kept from her uh, in the right. a couple of years good, of friendship. Good, and Good call. Nice, must be a nice collection. Yes. So whatever I can keep that is concrete, that's what I, you know, uh, same with photos. And uh, I, I just received a, a friend who sent me a book, you know, those blurb book you can do online of yeah. just iPhone photos he had. Well, I happen to have looked at the, this book five times in the last three days where I would have never looked at the photos on my right, phone right. at yeah. all. And so now I, I kind of want to make that for every, yeah. uh, you know, every memory. All right, next question is Ismael. Um, you, you have played with uh, all possible photographic formats and techniques uh, from film to digital. Uh, what are the, the lessons uh, you, you have le learned uh, from those experimentation? And uh, finally, what do you prefer and uh, why? Uh, well, I, I didn't move to digital as fast as some people did. I went about in 2008, just when he introduced these new um, full frame cameras where the quality really dramatically improved. Uh, and I, you know, I was slow to move, but now I'm a complete convert. Uh, uh, what I love about it in particular is the ability to photograph at night because um, I go to a lot of parties, I photograph there, I photograph people dancing, and I can really control now the ambient light, the lights that's in the room, even though it's not much in the disco, say, and then put in a little bit of flash just to sort of balance that. And I can read on the back of the camera how to make these things balance. And then I have made films, I've made uh, all kinds of stuff. I've even done radio programs. But in the end, it doesn't matter what you do, how you do it, whether, because, you know, a lot of, I bet some of you guys are still doing analog because uh, young people now are turning their back on digital and going back to film. They say it's better, more authentic. I mean, it's all rubbish, really, because ultimately it's about telling stories and it doesn't matter how you tell stories, whether it's film, digital, analog, radio, sound, music. If you've got a story to tell, then let's hear it. You know, that's what it's all about. You don't have to be intimidated by all technical things anymore. You know, when I started out, you had to understand how cameras work. You just bung them on automatic and shoot away. But ultimately, without a good story and without your relationship to the subject, that is the key thing. That's the thing you've got to express, okay? So you've got the world out there, you have yourself, you have to find a way of talking to that to the, the world, your subject matter, if you like, and that unique relationship, if you get that right, you can articulate that and then off you go, whether it's in film, digital, whatever. So that's the thing to look for, is that connection you can make to the world out there. And the quality of that connection is absolutely the key thing to making good work. Right, JR? 100%. <laughs> I wouldn't say better. I mean, I would say it in French. I don't know if it's better, but uh, I would never say it with that incredible English accent. Next question is from Eva. Hey, Martin. It's, Hi. It's very, very nice to meet you. <laughs> we're big fans. Uh, I, we were wondering, um, when you photograph, do you take a lot of frames or uh, do you produce, uh, or it depends and you produce a bit of frames? Uh, i tell you one thing I take a lot of, that's very bad photographs, okay? Uh, <laughs> I probably take more bad photos than most of the people on this screen here. Maybe even JR, you know? Because if you go out and you say to yourself, I'm only going to take a good picture, uh, you'd never start because most of the pictures we take are like warm ups for the moment when something reveals itself or something happens. Remember, if you're a photographer, you've got to be there before it happens, okay? So you've got to be ready, you've got to have that momentum, you've got to have that energy where you're shooting away and then you'll get the right picture. So I have to take a lot of bad pictures in order to get a good one. And when I look back on a year's shooting, say, uh, you know, half a million shots, whatever it is, in, and I got six good pictures a year, I'm thinking I'm doing, it's been a great year, you know? Uh, so this has been a screw up for the, because, you know, it's really tough for me to go and throw off people uh, because, you know, you're not allowed to at the moment. So I'm basically buggered over here, but I'm having to make the most of it. I'm actually started photographing birds on our bird table instead. And, oh, wow. uh, you know, <laughs> just for the hell of it. Uh, and also I'm going out and photographing queues outside shops because in Britain we love a queue and there's still queues. So it's like a very, it's like a British version of the lockdown that I'm trying to look at. But basically 
I take a lot of rubbish, and I hope you do too. Yeah. Okay. We, we can't wait to see what you've created during uh, during that uh, crazy time. Really, like, because that as one person whose work have been affected by this COVID thing is you. <laughs> so really? we want to see oh how God. you see people throughout that. <laughs> All right. Next question is. Baptiste, uh, who is our teacher from the art section. Hello, Martin. So Hi. with uh, with our students, we, we worked on, on a few of your projects, and uh, including point of sale. Yep. And it, it, it struck us as an unexpected subject matter to decide to photograph. Mm -hmm. And for that specific example, we were wondering if one of the characteristics of your uh, voice, I would say, is to uh, look at something that is unexpected or to look at something from a different uh, point of view than the ones we usually know? No, it's, it's a good point because I did that in the late 80s and um, it was just a time of Mrs. Thatcher. Suddenly everyone was shopping, shopping centers started coming up. And I think documentary photographers uh, are quite lazy because they have certain subjects that they like to photograph. Uh, they love to photograph things as they're about to close down. They love to go to a factory, which has got traditional methods and it's about to close down, so in they go, okay? So I, I think photographers, and documentary photographers in particular, uh, are often quite weak. Now, my job as a photographer is to try and think about how do we represent the times that we're in, and therefore, I think it's important, for example, to have done back in the 80s, uh, things like shopping scenes and, uh, going into shops and supermarkets and such like, which is what the point of sale is all about. So I'm very much aware of, you know, this idea of trying to keep up with the times and not being seduced by nostalgia, which many photographers are. All right. So the next one is uh, Elia. Elia, it's yours. Hi, Elia. Hi there. Uh, so, yeah, we had the chance to uh, study a lot of your uh, long-term projects so we were wondering how and uh, when you stop a project and also on the other end how um, what drives you to update some published work um, well I, I mean I have a massive archive so one of the things I've done I've been shooting pictures in the UK now and, and around the world for over 50 years uh, and often I will go into my archive and I'll think of a subject. So I'm about to publish a book about Ireland. Uh, I've been photographing in Ireland way back in black and white in the late 70s, to right last year, where I photographed a gay wedding and uh, all these startup companies in Dublin. So now's the time for me to do a book about Ireland. So I often have projects that are ongoing. I have ongoing projects like my exploration of what happens on the beach, but also I've just done a book on... Um, on people doing selfies, for example, which is a very modern thing, because you know the smartphone has changed the way we think about the world of photography quite dramatically. So I wanted to do something about that. I'm just going to see if I can find a. Co I'd love to show you a copy of that book. Can I just give a look? It's over on the shelf. I hope. I hope. I'd love to know how many books Martin have made. Uh, well, do, you can look it up on my site. It's about 120. Oh my so God. this is a quite recent book. This is called Death oh, by wow. Selfie. Okay, and it's the same shape as an iPhone. I'm going to open it, but I'm going to first explain to you why it's called Death by Selfie, okay? So I went to the uh, Death by Selfie pages on Wikipedia, and uh, there it said, more people have been killed by taking selfies in India than any other country in the world. So I concluded that basically there must be more selfies taken in India. It's a 1.3 population, 1.3 billion population, and that is indeed the case. So I went especially to India, as the cover picture is here, to photograph people doing selfies. So you open it up and you can see here, that's a beach scene in um, Mumbai. Let me yeah. show you, that's it from Hong Kong. And see, look how this opens up. So you've got pages that open up like that. There, there's the selfie queen on the beach in Goa. Can you see that? Yeah. Wow. And so it goes on. Now, here's an interesting notice, tells you that, um, Selfies are banned on this lake in Uti because in case you fall out of the boat and drown. <laughs> Man, that's, that happened, I'm sure. One in France, don't show any, do any of you know these people? Don't show them to me, they could sue me. This is at the, um, <laughs> <laughs> the 
This is at the tennis <laughs> tournament, Roland Gatto. What is it called? What's it called? The tennis tournament in Paris. Uh, Roland Garros. That's, at Mon that's also in France. It's at Mon Monaco, the Grand Prix. Oh, nice. Okay. So same thing. And, we uh, should not have the smaller band. There's selfie sticks in um, Venice, puncturing oh, yeah. the landscape. And that's, that's the last page. So you can see it, it's an object. I'm, I'm really like the idea of making a book that reflects the, the notion of what's going on in the book, but also, as I say, trying to keep up with the times that we live in. Wow, seems like a great, this, great All book. these books, by the way, are, are available, signed on, my, on the Martin Parr Foundation bookshop. Okay, we'll make sure to complete the collection. So I, I live in Bristol, and uh, there I, I opened a foundation. We have a museum, we have a gallery. We have an archive, we have a studio. And uh, I basically, the main idea is to try and show not only and collect my own pictures, but also to share with you other British documentary photographers who are very good quality, but also to show young emerging photographers to give them their first show. So if you're ever in Bristol, uh, please come and visit us and have a look at our site. And uh, we have a very active, we, we have a challenge every week, by the way, on the uh, Martin Parr Instagram page. So this week's challenge is about haircuts because you know, no one can go to the barber. <laughs> so we invited yeah. people to photograph them having their hair cut or showing bad haircuts or good hair. And every week we give away a book as a prize. So come and have a look at the challenges that we've done and come and join in and send us your picture and you might get a free Martin Parr signed book. Cool. So next question is Nathan. Oh yeah, hi. It's funny you speak about your foundation because my question is, are there uh, any new and inno innovative photo practices that excite you and challenge you? What are some of the people you would recommend that is your curiosity today? In the UK or just generally? Generally. Um, yeah, I mean, there are photographic galleries around the UK. Uh, uh, I mean, the most interesting people in the UK is someone called Multistory, who are a community arts association in near to Birmingham, which is the second city of the UK. And they by far have the most interesting program. They commission a lot of photographers uh, and they have a different way of presenting ideas, a different way of going about things, actually really touching uh, real people's lives, not just making it for the sort of uh, photo ghetto, which we're sort of part of, if you know what I mean. You know, because we love photography, we go to galleries, but most people in the world don't bother and are not that interested. So you have to, if you like, bring the art to them and present it on their terms rather than on your terms. So in the UK, they are by far the best uh, people in terms of what they're doing. Other than that, you know, I mean, it's great to see photography galleries in or galleries in London doing um, photography shows like the White Chapel, the Serpentine. Uh, but we don't have the equivalent of, say, the Jeu de Pomme that you have in Paris or La Palle. You know, I'd say you have a better set of galleries for photography in Paris than we do in London. But we do still do have photography shows in London. And there's a photographer's gallery which keeps on going with just photography, but it's much smaller than Gilles de Pomme, for example. Another good point of France. We're going back in the, you know, in, in your heart with France, with the Gilles de Pomme. Uh, let, let's hope it stayed this way. Next question is Lila. Um. Your election uh, at Magnum uh, came uh, with a lot of controversy uh, right. at the time. Uh, how do you explain that and uh, how has the situation uh, evolved since then? Well, uh, I can explain it very simply because, you know, I, I was elected by put in to join Magnum just after I'd done the last resort, which is in colour. And uh, people, some people found this offensive. You know, it, it really annoys some people here. It's this middle class kid going into this working class environment, showing, you know, this rather shabby conditions. And it pissed a lot of people off. But I mean, to my benefit, I realized that actually being controversial uh, didn't do you any harm. So uh, not only in Magnum, but generally, the response to that pro project was uh, quite, uh, you know, quite different. You know, some people liked it and some people didn't like it. Since then, though, I would say, you know, Magnum's been a lot more um, generous in terms of who they've admitted. And I think uh, my admission was opening, that started to open the door. And, you know, we have photographers as widely ranged as Anton Dagatar through to Christina de Midel. So we have some real interesting new people coming in and contributing to Magnum. In the end, 
what we're interested in is someone with a very distinctive voice and someone who can tell us a good story and to show that well through their own particular style and approach. So uh, I think the criteria from the old humanistic days of the earlier uh, photographers from Magnum have somewhat evolved into something a lot more exciting. And we needed to do that in order to help us survive because you know you can't live in the past, you've got to move forward and, uh, and uh, embrace all the different types of photography that are around now. Thank you. Are you happy now in Magnum? Yeah, yeah, I, I was the president for three and a half years. Um, that was an interesting thing to do. So yeah, uh, I mean, we obviously are going to have to think how we restructure when we come out of this um, pandemic, because you know, it's going to affect all these agencies, all these people in the arts are going to have to, if, if you like, reappraise what they're doing, how they're doing it, how they're funding. So we'll have to do the same with everybody else. But that process already started. And I hope we'll survive and come around to be even stronger afterwards. All right, next one is Baptiste again. Uh, about the political aspect of your work, do you mm -hmm. think your work is, is um, infused with a lot of uh, political message? And how do you draw the line between your own political commitment and, and how much of that you let uh, flood into your work? Uh, I would say, you know, there's definitely politics in my pictures. I think if you're a photographer, a sort of documentary or photojournalist or an artist, you, you're obviously nearly always from the left. You know, it's almost impossible to have a right wing photojournalist unless they're working for someone like Fox News. So, uh, but the difference is some people really make sure that their politics are worn on their sleeve. They're worn, you know, very out, outwardly going. My politics are somewhat hidden. So you have to sort of look for it. But if you want to find it, you'll find the sort of things that I'm interested in, you know, definitely come with politics involved. And it's from the left wing perspective, because if you're left wing, you have to like people. And I really enjoy meeting people. I like people, respect people. And that comes out, I hope, through the photography. All right. Next question is Aristide. Yes, I wanted to ask you about the New Brighton project. And um, yeah. there are more or less 80 pictures in it. Uh, so it's only really 40 in the book. Yeah, uh, yes, on the specific, specific book. And uh, that was shot on three summers. That's I wanted to right. know how many images did you actually produce while working? Uh, on the I mean, I don't know exactly, but thousands upon thousands. Obviously, the 40 is a very tight edit from many thousands of pictures. Um, and often, uh, you know, you, I end up having more pictures in a book, but it's funny that the most successful book I've probably ever done has some of the least. So it just shows you don't need so many pictures to make a big statement. You know, often we can't, we're, 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 we can't let go of our children, which is a common mistake for photographers. They put in too many pictures into their projects, into their books and water down the message. All right. And, um, and how did you construct the, the narrative of it? I wanted to know. It just came together quite easily. I, I self-published the book initially, and um, you know, it just, um, it just, it, I just basically took took the best pictures, and sequenced them, and it all seemed to work. It, it was remarkably easy to actually put it together. Actually, taking them was the more difficult thing. You know, accumulating the pictures is never easy. That's why I took it over three summers to do it. All right. Yeah, I saw it as a long day, um, finishing with the rain, and uh, we spoke about that two days ago, so mm -hmm. see, if, if it was that easy, it's, a, it's better. Thank you. All right, question by Andrea. Okay, I, um, okay my question especially concerns your, your project, uh, Common Sense. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, in the instruction for the exhibition of uh, Common Sense, the curators had the freedom of arranging um, the images as they pleased. Why wasn't um, such chains allowed in the construction of the book. Uh, also, we weren't sure about the meaning you um, intended for the title, uh, Common Sense. Okay, so this is a project I did in the spring of 99, and a few years earlier, I discovered the pleasures of using the uh, macro lens and the ring flash. It's a combination usually associated with um, medical photography. And I got very excited by this ability to come in very close and right up front to these, um, this subject matter. And in the spring of 99, I decided to do an exhibition of this. And together with the Magnum London office, we made, I think, 45 different sets. And we sent it out to 45 different galleries around the world. And these exhibitions are on simultaneously at the same time. 
So that was quite an achievement. We actually got a Guinness Book of Records exhibition uh, record there for having the most shows on in more galleries than, than any other artist ever, in fact. So I was very happy with that, although I didn't apply for it. And the idea of common sense is to come in very close and to look at the flotsam and jetsam, the sort of debris of society. So although it's very brightly colored, it's actually one of the most depressing books that I've ever done. And we made the book. Uh, I'll get the book now and just show you, hang on. Yeah, so here's the book. And what you see in the book, which is interesting, there's not a piece of white paper. It's everything is printed. So this first double page spread, that's where I, I made that specially for signing purposes. That's our daughter using some bubble gum. And then you go through and you have all these different pictures. And so really it's about the sort of throwaway junk society that we all, in, we all inhabit. There's a lot of um, things like mouths and lollipops. So it's a completely crazy book. So for me, it was a very exciting project because this is a new combination. And this is, if you like, the first project that I did using this combination of pictures. What else did you ask about it? I'm trying to remember. Common sense, the name. I mean, it's an English phrase. It means being very sensible. And common sense is like a sense, you know, a shared sense. But it also means being very sensible. It's an English pun, which you may not understand. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> made in England on the back nice all right next question is Aristide again yes uh, Martin you I know you insist on the importance of uh, the archive that you're, you're creating project after project and um, does one of your projects stand, stand out uh, as doing a better job than the others on uh, the specific angle of the archive the ar collection of archive the archive of, of other photographers that I have, you mean? Yes. I guess there are certain photographers that we have a lot of work of. Uh, people like Tom Wood, who's very good, Chris Killip, Tony Ray Jones. I mean, the people I really think are important. I've gone in and, um, you know, acquired their work and, and collected it. And uh, I have things like book dummies. So one of the things I collect are the original dummies when people uh, used to make them with literally silver prints in. Now, of course, uh, you have a PDF, so people don't actually make physical dummies anymore. But we've, we've got about a collection of 20 different dummies from important photography books in the UK. So, yeah, uh, we have a, a librarian who's doing the inventory of all this. This will be all available. We have a membership scheme, which if people joined, you can come along and uh, use the library and research things. You know, if you if you ever doing a project about the history of British photography, you know, we have a very good place to come and see a lot of British photography and see all the books and the exhibitions that we've done around it. So I think the the thing that's most important is this idea of um, an archive about the history of British photography since the war. And we're now writing a book about this. My friend Jerry Badger, who did the uh, three volumes of the photo book of history, I did we did these together. He's now writing a book about the history of um, British photography, which will be coming out next year. Yes. All right. All right, GB, it's your turn. Hey, Martin. Hi. So, um, you have often worked with brands. What has that allowed you in creative terms? So I often working where? With brands. Brains? Brands. 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 Yeah. Like, uh, you know, brands. brands uh, oh, brands, right, right. Brands, Colin, yeah. right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I do commercial work. Um, uh, I do commercial work for one reason, it's paid very well. And this means that uh, I can do this quite quickly and get the money to put into my foundation and to basically subsidize my own work. Uh, I think what's interesting for me is, you know, I, I think of photography as a, a problem solving exercise, you know, so. If you're doing fashion, for example, you know, you have some clothes, you have some handbags, whatever, you have to try and make an interesting picture out of that. So it, you know, it'll please the client and then go on and be part of advertising. So I'm quite happy to do that. I've done a lot of work with Gucci, who are an interesting company uh, to work with. They have a very interesting um, chief designer who basically took Gucci away from being a sort of more glamorous into something more authentic. And because I guess I have an authentic voice within photography, they, if you like, came more towards what I was doing rather than the other way around. 
So yeah, it's a very useful way of generating income uh, to basically run the foundation and to run my own life. You don't do it advertising, do you, JR? Uh, no, I don't. I don't. But I, we have that conversation with the students because I'm not telling them not to do it. I'm saying no. that's very personal to my work. Uh, and uh, I give them example. We actually have course about branding and co-branding, uh, about people who are actually in charge of doing those co-branding things so that they can say when it works well for artists, when it doesn't. Uh, right. So that they can make their own decision, of course. But, uh, but uh, you yeah, never you want know, any of your projects sponsored by a brand or anything like that, correct? Yeah, it, but it, in my case, it's tricky because uh, first, a lot of it is illegal. So then a lot of those brands w would not be sure at the beginning to be part of it because maybe yeah. it would create them trouble. But then later on, when there'll be some more official exhibition, I realized that all the work that I have done before with the communities, I, I didn't want it to. Uh, uh, suddenly involve uh, L'Oreal or a shampoo brand I understand, yeah. doing a Women yeah. Are Heroes project. So uh, I realized that then uh, it in some way give more values to the artwork so I can, you know, pay my team, work, and maybe I would make much more money with brands, but I can still live without brands. So I decided yeah. uh, that okay. way. Uh, and I hope I take it as a challenge. So I hope I can, I can do that uh, for a long time. Uh, but it's definitely a challenge in those days. Next question is uh, Tiziano. Hi. My question is, don't you feel that some of those collaborations turn your work into products that feed the very conception frenzy that you seem to criticize? Uh, yes, I think that's a good point. But, you know, I, I love a bit of good hypocrisy, you know, so I'm not at all scared of, of that, at all, you know, whatsoever. And, you know, I am a brand myself, remember, okay? So uh, it's like, if I can get other brands to help my brand and help pay for my brand, I'm very happy. You know, we're all in this together, you know? I mean, it's interesting to hear the JR speaking about his um, altruism about, uh, you know, avoiding brands, but in the end, you know, I don't have any shame in doing it. It's very clear that when I'm working for someone else, they're paying me very well because the thing that I'm losing is I'm not doing work for myself my own agenda you know they are setting the agenda within that uh, terminology i will try and make it uh, as interesting as possible through this process of solving problems but in the end you know it's them that control the agenda and they get to choose which pictures they they want to show and in order to compensate for that you get very well paid so it swings and roundabouts but i i acknowledge a bit of hypocrisy uh, i have no <laughs> shame in being a slight hypocrite <laughs> Thanks, Martin. All right, next one is Baptiste. Yes, we were we were all interested uh, because we know we know his work from other sources uh, about your collaboration with M a few years ago. Yeah, and we were wondering if you had other similar collaborations with artists in different fields of arts in mind, and and who you would like to work with. Uh, yeah, the, the uh, relationship with M was, was a very nice one. We did a project together, which was great fun. Uh, he came to me, we met up, and we found we got on. And uh, it, it was a very good outcome. We had the show in Arles, and then it came to Paris. Uh, that's quite unusual for me to do a direct uh, work with um, a musician. The, the only other people I've regularly worked with in the UK is Madness, the band. And I just did another shoot with them recently for their 40th anniversary of their, of their being out. And, um, but other than that, no, I haven't done mu musical collaborations. So M was quite unique. And one, one question, uh, you remember that film where you filmed the people under the wind, you know, uh, by the seaside in the, in the UK? Yeah, think of England, uh, right? Yeah. Is that online? Can, can they see it? I, I didn't know how to find uh, it. Yeah, I think if you go to YouTube and you put in Think of England, you, you should be able to find that. Okay, and uh, so are you making a lot of films still, or is that a... No, not so much. No, no. I mean, um, I did some films with multi-story, and uh, I have, at the moment, on BBC One, I have these little films that go between each program. Uh, so okay. I did uh, 26 films, but they're only 30 seconds long. Uh, so um, they, they're being shown on, on British television. Other than that, no, I haven't done films in the last five years or so. That's the only exception. I mean, I'd love to do more film, I just never, never have the time. Because, yeah. you know, in the end, uh, I'm a still photographer. And, it, you know, film takes a lot of time. That's the trouble with it. Even though oh, I love yeah, the idea of it. 
Martin, as, as you're mentioning uh, the multi-story uh, collaboration that you did or, or commission that you did, it, it led to a book, to an exhibition, to a newspaper and to some film. Is there for you a d definitive form of a project or is the, the combination of all the different media what you think of as the, f the final form of a project? Yeah, I think, I mean, ultimately I'd say out of all those that came out, the, the book and the still pictures, that's the thing that I probably put more investment in, in terms of time and everything. But other than that, you're absolutely right. I, I love the idea of having multiple platforms for a particular project and collaboration. So the films, the newspapers, the magazines, it, it, everything is valid. But if I had to choose one, it would still be the still pictures. But I, I'm, I'm all for the multiple platforms. Great, all right, next question is uh, Emily. Can you tell a little bit more of what you have in, in mind uh, for your foundation in Bristol? Well, we continue to have, uh, we have talks, we have workshops. I mean, we're just trying to work out now. We have four exhibitions a year. You know, when we start to open again, which might be in the next month or so, uh, you know, how do we do things like social distancing for the exhibitions? Uh, for the talks, that's going to be a bit of a problem. But we also are thinking of doing more things online, of course. And, um, you know, we, we've built up a fantastic uh, reputation or a fantastic following with our membership. We have over 400 members now that come and join in and uh, they come along and they're very loyal and they buy from our bookshop. So I think because we've really tried to, you know, we haven't got a, a single penny of public funding. I have to publicize, I have to basically uh, you know, supervise this myself personally, you know, from the work that I'm doing, like with the uh, brands and such like. Uh, and also we do generate some some income from the membership scheme, from selling books and selling talks. So we just hope to keep on going, you know, but obviously this um, pandemic has been a bit of a, an upset for us some because it's, it's sort of somewhat thrown our program. But, you know, we're going to come back uh, stronger than ever. That's the idea. So, uh, yeah, please subscribe to our newsletter and you can see what we're doing you know we send a free newsletter out it tells you what we're doing and you can keep up with what we're up to and look at our instagram page as well we will do by them question and last one for you and for the team we work with kamel minu who is an important figure in contemporary art do you relate in do you relate to other contemporary artists what is your sentiment about the current art world the current, uh, right, uh, the current art world, I love and hate it. You know, I love going to art uh, fairs and photographing there. I've been to Frack, I've been to Basel, you know, uh, I, I like the art world. Um, I mean, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, some of the dealers I have around the world are photography ones, and Camel is a, an art dealer. And, uh, you know, it, it's tough to, you know, he has such big names. I'm sort of pretty uh, slow, this is way down on the pecking order, but nonetheless, it's a very good place to be. We're planning to do a show in the next year because I haven't had a show there for a while. But I, I love the art world and, and sort of hate it at the same time. I mean, I think it's pretentious, uh, whatever, you know, but there's some great artists out there. I'm very friendly with this guy called Grayson Perry. I don't know if you, has he come, have you come across him in France? Uh, yes, he, he done a show in, uh, sorry. Yes, he's done a show last year in, in Paris at La Monnaie de Paris. Okay, good. Because he's a brilliant artist and, and very, he's currently doing a show on British television and, uh, called Grayson's Art Club, where he's getting people to make art through the pandemic. So I'm going to be on that in a couple of weeks' time, in fact. So yeah, uh, I like the art world, but I hate it too. I, I think it's pretentious, but I love pretensions. I love all those crazy uh, fashion people, those crazy art people. They make great photographs. And the more <laughs> pretentious they are, the better the photographs. Great. Thank you, Martin. Do you have a, a last advice to give uh, all of us? Uh, here. Well, go out and make the, your connections to the world even stronger uh, when it, we're in post-pandemic times, because that's the thing that really counts. Well, thank you so much for taking the time. And, no problem. Uh, I enjoyed it. All our question with this terrible uh, French accent, uh, and you know, we we had a special day today because of you. Okay. Thank you. Au revoir. Thank you. Au revoir. À bientôt.